the fact that as a human being, as an eternal sentient being, you understand the intrinsic value of pain. If there was nothing else than that, that's 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 closing the gap. That's a level up. That 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 alone, just that alone. You know what I mean? The knowledge of God and the knowledge of God. You know, one of the fruits of it being this understanding of pain. That alone has has changed everything, because that's the that's the root of addiction. Escaping from pain, trying to escape from pain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Through the pursuit of pleasure. Right. Wow. Okay, so hi, welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, <laughs> Andrew, and I'm going to ask tonight, Father Turbo and Cyprian, how did you guys, or how did you find out your saint was going to be your saint, your patron saint was going to be your saint? Like, um, was, it, was it chosen for you? Did you choose your saint? And like, maybe what was the connection there? As much as you're comfortable talking about. I think Father Turbo can. Father Turbo chose mine, so he could probably say why, <laughs> or maybe he did. He he informed me. Let's say he definitely. As time has gone on, I'm seeing it was definitely chosen by a higher power. But perhaps Father Turbo could enlighten. I've never actually asked you. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it was it was fairly obvious to me. Um, but I think in general, um, I don't want to give I don't want to get too much into it, give people the wrong impression. But um, you know, I, I really do know that the saints pick people, mm -hmm. um, and so generally, it's really pretty evident. Um, the timing is always kind of you know, but it, a lot of times it's really evident. I mean. And before it was even a go, it was pretty evident for me, like, oh, like Cyprian, you know, and I think it's kind of obvious in the sense that, like, you know, your background um, in regards of, you know, the left-hand path, and mm -hmm. it was just very evident. Um, and even in the connection of uh, St. Uh, Eustina mm -hmm. and her virtue undoing the the prophet um p r o f i t that cyprian had occurred you know from just kind of like being a mercenary in the occult mm -hmm. in many ways you know um you know with all due respect not not that your wife is a saint but i saw a parallel i, I mean i see a parallel there oh for also. sure no Does question about sense? it you know what oh. i mean father there's no question like you know to saying? a frustrating degree sometimes you know <laughs> So <laughs> she she foils my pl my plans constantly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. So way. it's like I I think I I think what I want to get across is most people who know you or know of you they would they could see the correlation oh, in yeah, regards yeah. of like the dark and the occult. But I I think that other side of it, which is just as important, if not more important, in that your wife was the means for you to come into God, and although Justina wasn't his wife, you know what I mean that that feminine nurture. Well, but love. they're pictured together in the icons. They so, are. I mean, there, there are, they are. they are sort of wed and they, they, they were are. wed in death in that way too. So it's very interesting. Exactly. Exactly. And so to me, that's just as much a part of it as anything else in regards of you being called by him. If that, if that makes sense, you know, I mean, I gotta say one thing is, is, and I and I don't know, Father. Maybe you have some comment on this, but he's he's like obviously he's my patron. There's no question about it. And I don't know whether it's because of, of the fact that there's so so tight of a correlation, but um, 
it is a it it is an ongoing challenge and i think one that i will have my whole life of uh it's very intimidating approaching uh cyprian of antioch saint cyprian of antioch like as a as a saint in like as as a patron in my private prayer getting I, I i it's much easier to get there's lots of saints that it's been much easier for me to just get close to but there's a lot there you know, if if that makes sense is that making sense like it's very challenging for yeah i mean for me to on every to. level because um some people don't have this but if someone has a right orientation towards a hierarchy mm. um and the episcopacy it's like he was a bishop so just right. that alone right there just that alone right there in regards of like approaching a bishop and not being um I hadn't thought about that. Like, you know, kind of casual and formal is really mm-hmm. important. So there's that. And then, you know, to be frank, dealing with someone who has who has the discernment to really look through all of the excuses that can come. Yeah. Right? Because true. there there's that a too. whole that's another thing that I think people don't understand. It's like uh <clears throat> the um like some of the effects of when when people have been really deep into the occult, you know, there's there's two things I always look for. It's um, there's there's a lasting effect of of depression that you have to watch out for, mm-hmm. depression and melancholy. But there, there's also this um, which becomes difficult for uh, interpersonal relationships, but. There's a um, there's a duplicity that gets inculcated in the character of someone when they are involved mm-hmm. in the occult, right? And mm-hmm. so that's really tough, especially because that's one of the things that has to get baked out of us when we begin to approach Christ and the saints and, and the holy things. And that's part of why that um, resistance towards holy things happens for people that are involved with the darkness because it isn't just this random, like, um, like uh, magnetic repulsion, like, Oh, positive and negative. Mm-hmm. It has everything to do with, you know, the, the layers of falsehood that are involved in approaching mm. that because it's like, you know, it, it's fundamentally, uh, you know, it's fundamentally, um, you know, kind of like a, a, a relations based on prostitution. It's like, you mm-hmm, know, sure. I sure, will absolutely. do this, you will do this, you know what I mean? And your whole kind of being becomes framed on this. Yes. Which is which is the falsehood, you know what I mean? And it's a yes. it's a cheapening of, of the self. It's like you're looking to bargain your soul. Even if you don't look at it in such a kind of like um direct, obvious kind of uh Faustian sense, that's ultimately what's happening. You, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. And so when you encounter the holy which looks at you in the light of what you're intended to be the shame of that the sh- the 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 shame of disappointing love it's very difficult you know what i mean so there's just i don't know there's just a lot of layers there for sure for sure mm, no that's helpful that's helpful Father, um, what what is uh I, i'm sure everybody want, who doesn't know wants to know how how and this uh, is turbo this is why wants. i wanted to bring this up kind of I think it needs to be addressed. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't need to be, but it's like, hey, you know, um, turbo was obviously not invented for the English language to mean going really fast. It was a word yeah. that already existed. Existed. It was a name that already existed long before America decided or someone decided mm-hmm. to say turbo means going really, really fast. It's the origin story tonight, I guess. I mean. So what spill it, Father, as much as you're comfortable spilling. Sure, did- sure. Um, well, I I'll, I'll lay out the whole thing for everyone tonight. I guess it's I guess it's time because there's been there's been aspects that have been kind of obscured, you know, over time. But I acquired the name um the Nom La Guerre uh when I was uh during my time tattooing actually um but it wasn't actually um in the context of of tattooing that i got it i actually got it um 
during my time in playing in bands. So, um, dude, from the mid nineties in the mid nineties, all, all through the nineties, really. But around the time of the late mid to late nineties, I got really involved, um, with some particular genres of music. And there was a kind of resurgence of, you know, garage and glam in particular, um, that came about. And so the bands that I were, that I was playing with in the scene I was in, we were really into that. Um, and so, um, I had, I had a friend, um, who, you know, this is, it's kind of funny, but Long story short, there was there was a band Turbo Negro, if if you've ever heard of them, um, and so they were like a kind of you know, um, a kind of you know, there's this new upcropping of kind of like a post glam, kind of death rock type of thing going on, um, and so anyways, you know, I, I acquired the name from there, and it was it was kind of like an obvious thing because. Um, you know, for all, you know, if you can read between the lines there, but so I, you know, I was kind of being called that. And, um, I remember I was working at the, the tattoo shop at the time and they were like, oh yeah, you need a name, you need a name and you don't give yourself a nickname, you know? So, um, I'll never forget the day I walked in and, um, the guy, Tom, he was, uh, the guy who owned the shop and, Someone had been, someone had called for me, and I was out um, doing some nefarious business, and I was coming back into the shop. Basically, the person had called and I said, "Yeah, it's Turbo there," and he was, and he was like, "Like, what are you talking about? There's no Turbo there." I'm like, yeah, you know, skinny black guy with long hair. That's how long ago this was, whatever. And so, as I walked in, you know, Tom's like, "Oh, that's it, that's it, that's your name, whatever." So I was like, "Oh, okay, whatever." It was just. I didn't pay any attention, but as time goes on, you know, everyone in the shop's calling me that. And then, um, you know, the guy at the 7-Eleven's calling me that. And just, you know, it got to the point where that that was my name, you know. So there's all kinds of ways you can take it. But the point being is that was my name. And then um, some time after that is when I encountered Christ. I began to follow Christ. And I really, I actually tried to get rid of the name because I, I had it associated with you know, my time doing everything, you know, Um, but it just, it, it stuck. And so um, you fast forward, I get married and um, we're coming to the church and I'm looking for a patron saint and I have a friend, John, he's a deacon, Deacon John, shout out to Deacon John. And he calls me up one day and he's like, Hey, are you still looking for a patron saint? I was like, yeah, 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 you know. And I was thinking about St. Martin of Tours, maybe St. Moses, you know, some some kind of obvious ones. And he's like, I think you better I think you better hold up. I said, why is that? He's like, there's a St. Turbo. And I was like, shut up. There's no way. And he's like, yeah, yeah, check it out. And sure shooting, he shows it to me. And I was like, wow, that's that's crazy, you know. But the funny thing is, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that because that's that's ridiculous. And just to kind of show you the mindset, I was like, that's ridiculous. And the other thing is, you know, I'm trying to like turn my life around, like becoming orthodox and, you know, all these Arabs and all these other foreign people. They're, they're already going to have a hard enough time with me being tattooed and black and blah, blah, blah. I had all these logos me running around in my head, you know, at the time. And um, I was like, so having a crazy name like that's just going to make it worse. You know, why would I why would I do that? You know? But as my baptism day got closer and closer, I started, it, it really started kind of dawning on me. I was like, like, what are the odds of that? You know, like, 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 what are the odds truly? Like, like, what are the odds of that? You know what I mean? Um, and so, you know, I was like, okay. And then some things started to happen. And, um, you know, I've talked about, you know, depression in my life and, a big part of the depression in my life came from being in the occult for sure. Um, but tied to the occult in my life was also my use of, you know, my, my playing music and just the vainglory that's associated with that, you know, the kind of faux rock star mentality that a lot of people have. And that caused me a lot of that, that vanity 
that ego caused a lot of depression in my life. And it was actually through saying Turbo and the obscurity of who he was and realizing like, okay, this, he, and not in a cool way, not like, like, oh, here's this band no one's ever heard of. It was like, he showed me what it meant to be, you know, like that humility of being obscure and just only being known for the sake of Christ that began to crack you know, the kind of like glass for me that, that like opaque glass of like, why they just my, my self obsession in the vanity that was associated with, you know, music really like playing music was, it was a huge problem for me. Um, as crazy as it sounds to people. And then, you know, the thing that, you know, more obvious things began to come to surface. Like how did I even come to orthodoxy? What was the icon? I mean, everyone's heard that story, but it's like, I walked into, um, my wife had worked for a couple. They're Orthodox, and I walked into their house in the foyer of their house. There's a Pantocrator icon, and it's like I had that's the closest I've ever had to like, you know, being slayed in the spirit and like almost passed out. And I was like, what is that? You know, and they're like, oh, it's an icon. You know, everyone's heard that story before, but that's how I came to Orthodoxy was literally like Christ came to me through the icon. And, you know, what is Saint, who is Saint Turbo? Well, he was a martyr, second century. And there was a series of martyrdoms and St. Turbo was the last one to record the martyrdoms and he was, and he was martyred. Well, what was he martyred for? For the remembrance of the saints. What are icons? The remembrance of the saints. I mean, icons, the remembrance of the saints in, in, in picture form. Right. And so it was like, wow, it's, it was so obvious to me. Like his whole life was about putting forward the life of Christ in the saints. And I was like, that's all I want. You know, I don't, I don't want to be known for anything else in this world except for I, I loved Christ and I pointed people to Christ, period. Like, may everything else fall into the sea. I don't care. And that's, that was like one more beacon. And so, you know, it just, it was so obvious. It was so obvious to me that if I had chose not to take St. Turbo, that would have been vanity. Because I would have chosen because I wanted people to take me seriously. Because it's to this day still, <clears throat> excuse me, people still make jokes like, oh, okay, whatever. Like, oh, is that really? But it's like, you know, he chose me. And, and those moments where I've doubted, you know, why am I even in the church? This is like hard. I just think about, hold on, like your name's Turbo. Like, what are the odds of that? Like, he chose me. And the fact that, he chose me shows that God had a place for me. Like I belong in the Orthodox church. Like yeah, I was meant to be here. Um, and I have, I have someone in the heavens who, I mean, next to Christ and his Holy mother, there's nobody I want to meet more than, than my patron because I'm like, man, who are you? You know what I mean? And like, I love you. Why have you done this for me? You know, you, you've like, You've given me a name and a life in, in, in Christ. And that's something that no, no, like you couldn't, I couldn't make that stuff up, you know? Hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, wow. Well, okay. Well, How do you follow that? <laughs> good luck following that. So <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm glad it's you. I was going to ask. Oh, is there, is that, is, do you have an icon name? of uh St. Turbo? Yeah. You see him right yeah, there. I, a little bit no. of there we there, go. There, right there. Okay. Yeah. Writing. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. You want to hear Straparian? Yeah. 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 Let me set this. It's a crazy episode today. It's like, oh, probably going to die tonight. <laughs> you don't have it memorized, Father? No. So I should, but you know, we can't have it all, Andrew. We can't have it all, can we? Uh, illuminated by the light of humility, by the shining crowns of the martyrs before you, like an iconographer you painted with your blood, the remembrance of Christ's holy ones, a holy martyr turbo, intercede before Christ our God that would save our souls. You know, like, I think it was last year, on my feast day, and then all of a sudden I hear everyone like saying the Traparian. So it's just man, God's been so generous to me to the prayer. What's of Saint the Turbo. 
What's the line painting iconography in your blood? Oh, like an iconographer you painted with your blood. I mean, that's just so you, though. I mean, that's just like you just have emulated Turbo, St. Turbo. It's just like, no, I mean, it's metal, but it's iconography at the same time. So he's great. He's great. He's great. Yeah, that is a pretty metal Traparian. (laughs) Very (laughs) metal. (laughs) I think there's a good amount, or at least Father sent me a compilation. So, like, there's like a girl talking. She's like, I mean, orthodoxy is like, in the traditional sense, the most metal religion that goes like yeah and it's like a blast beat yeah, and someone's yeah, screaming great. it shows all these monks like holding skulls and stuff I like mean, that like monks. it's it's pretty good i was like well, yeah, i try I mean, to tell people i try to tell kids all the time it's like hey man do you know like shine all this other fan all this fantasy stuff you're talking about i mean we got real like what you want jedis you want wizards we got like the real lizards like, yeah like, you look <laughs> awesome. at a skeeto monk you're like good night you know like yeah. there's like yeah. um on uh there's like a on a youtube short or something somebody recorded a schema monk walking and even just that video of like a schema monk walking on athos you just see them like walking up like a path i'm just like oh my gosh it's like straight out of tolkien it's like something straight out of tolkien it's like uh okay like because Mm -hmm. the whole schema it's like i yeah maybe it's it's not but it's like it's just such like a Oh my gosh, like I can't even it's just I can't even think about it. And like if I were to see a scheme, I I think I would have the proper reaction of like I am just not gonna say anything. I will stand. It's like that thing a long time ago where he talked about if you could take a car ride with anyone famous, anyone in history, who would it be? And we mm-hmm. none of us mm-hmm. chose saints. Like it's like no. that, too much. It's like too much. Do you want me to? I'm gonna stop and get some snacks. Do you like want anything? Like, do you stick? And he's like, yes. If you have like, if they have like an old, partially chewed up piece of like bread in the back from like a pizza crust or something, I'll take that and be like, you want like Doritos too or something? No, it's like like just a little bit of salt. Yeah, just, right. <laughs> yeah, just, for real. Just a, just pinch like, of salt. a pinch of salt. A pinch of salt. I'm like, water? Like, no. It's like my the the scripture is my diet. I'm like okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> well, my story is not nearly as interesting. Um, but I think the story goes that my mom uh, was a Protestant Christian. Um, it was she's since converted to Orthodoxy, and I believe that she told me that she was at some kind of worship service or something like that, and God told her to name me Andrew. I, I think mm-hmm. is what um is what the story is and my mom is a listener so i'm sure she'll correct me if that's wrong but it's something to that effect but it was like um yeah that and so and there's been a there's been a large amount of resemblance like um similarities between us like when i was going to become orthodox um i was like uh gonna choose i think i was thinking about saint vladimir because I was really into Russian culture at the time. And I was like, okay, well, St. Vladimir. And then I also really was like into the idea of people calling me Vladimir at church and stuff. And I was like, going to be like, okay, yeah, I'm Vladimir now. Andrew's the old guy. But um, my priest, my baptizing priest was like, no, you're Andrew. Andrew's your saint. And um, there's just been a couple like really similarities. Um, Andrew's always supposed to be depicted with wild hair. And like my entire life, I've always had wild hair, like, you know, looking back on pictures and it's something people have always talked about with me. Like, I'm not even like trying to be like, uh, I'm making something up to sound cool. It's like, no, my teachers, my friends, people I've hung out with, they've always been like that dude's hair is insane. Like, it's always just like all over the place. And that's Andrew. Um, and you know, like when I was little, um, a couple of my mom's friends, their kids, or I think at least one family in particular, didn't, they were atheist or whatever. They weren't Christian. And like, they literally had to go to my mom and be like, your son, Andrew needs to stop talking about God to my son. Like he will not stop ministering to him. Like he will not stop talking to this dude about God. Please tell him to stop. Like, and, um, and uh, there's a couple other things I can't remember like um i can't remember off the top of my head but it was just very very clear that andrew wanted me pretty early on 
I was the first called, um, you know, out of my family. Uh, my cousin was the person who got me into orthodoxy, but out of me and my immediate family, I was the first called. I was the person that was like, I you know the first like was exposed to the church and then was like, yeah, this is it. And then since then, a couple of people have followed me in um, and I was the first one in. And there's a couple other similarities. I can't really remember what it was. It wasn't some big experience. It was anything like that. But it was uh, in that way that oftentimes kind of confirms, like, no, this is God. It was looking back. I started to see a bunch of stuff. I started to be like, oh, oh, you know, and I'm not even, like, really looking for it. It just kind of shows up. Um, And then since then, and, you know, kind of at the time, I was kind of bummed. I was like, yeah, I mean, I've always kind of been associated with this guy. Andrew's always St. Andrew, the first call has always, I kind of always been associated with him. I've always kind of like, oh, nice, Andrew, you know, whatever. And so I was kind of bummed, but now like I have a great love for the saint. Like that is my saint. That is Saint Andrew. He's my dude. Like that's my saint. I have a great, great love for him. And he's an apostle. Um, and uh he's just like, and and yeah, and Aside from the St. Andrew stuff, there's loads of other amazing stories. My wife, I'm not going to tell it because it's not my story. My wife has the best story of how she got her saint chosen for her. 100% chosen for her little little tidbit by the monks of Mount Athos, by a monk on Mount Athos, never met this woman before in her entire life, and never met my wife, and my baptizing priest showed up with an icon. That's your saint. And she was like, Okay. And that was it. And like, um, there's a lot more to it, but that's the one little tidbit I'm comfortable. And then like my, this is the last one, St. Nikolai, who I also ain't looking at Nikolai Velimirovich, who is my son's saint. I like, at first I was a completely different person, but father chose St. Nikolai. And I kind of fought him a little bit on it. I was like, no, I really want St. David of Wales. Uh, but father's like, no, it's St. Nikolai. It's St. Nikolai Velimirovich. That is your son's saint. Well, it is. Yes, that is Reuben's saint. And St. Nikolai's, I think his feast day falls on my brother's birthday, according to the old calendar. So it's like, okay, yeah, St. Nikolai is Reuben's saint. And um, 100%, like, just that is his saint. So, yeah, I've got a couple more of them. I won't go into them, you know. You know, speaking about speak of thy mysteries, you know, so I, I don't I don't really want to like just be sensationalist, but it's pretty incredible. Like it's pretty incredible. So yeah. Well that that objective ooh, that objective piece is is kind of everything, right? Like the undeni the undeniable aspects. And it is the thing that has separated I mean it's it's that we. It's also that weird trade off, and I mean, I know I've talked about this before, and since you kind of broached the subject, Father, of like the things that come out of, I guess, an experience with the occult. Like one of the things that sticks with me is is really knowing what's a like that there that that the material world does manifest like the spiritual basically that the mystical mystical things are happening and that when they happen, you know, and I think that there's a, what I, it was what I always saw as missing from the Christianity, the Western Christianity that I always encountered was there was like kind of a talk of mystical things, but like I would, it was just talk because I could tell that people weren't actually hadn't actually had an experience of the things that they were referring. Like we're all talking here. And I think anybody that's like, you don't even have to be a spiritually minded person. You could just tell like, well, at least whether or not you believe it, I think that you could just be like, well, those guys definitely believe it. Like there's no question that, that what they're talking about, they, to them, they've actually experienced it. And this is the thing when, like, I would encounter, you know, Protestants out preaching on the street or whatever, the dude with the megaphone in L.A., you know, dudes in the uh, or or in Vegas, you know, just going droning on and on. And I'm like, yeah, it's not what you're talking because I, I don't see it in your your body language would reflect it if, if you were actually like preaching something that you had seen to go back to like Andrew, 
to go back to any of the apostles, right? It's they had seen these things happen. It would have been obvious to anybody that they were preaching to. Never mind the fact that the Holy Spirit is there with them, but it's like it would have just been obvious that, like, oh yeah, these guys actually saw this. And then their willingness to be martyred is like, oh, yeah, they did actually, they must have actually seen this because they're not going to deny what they actually saw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um I was invited a, a, a year ago, maybe two years ago, to give a talk on like mysticism. You know, like how do you mm-hmm. how do you talk about that, right? Um and especially, you know, it's just it's real fascinating because there's this whole thing where people may think they know about orthodoxy and then or they're they're interested. It's like, oh yeah, orthodoxy is mystical, mysticism. And like I think they have a real, there's a lot of misnomers around that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, it was kind of funny because I went in there and, you know, I mean, I, I I based a lot of the talk around, you know, apophatic theology, like not, no, you know, not being able to define God. Right. But one of the key things I was trying to drive home from them is that, like real mysticism is only actually encountered through a practical knowing. So like anyone who's had real mystical experience, it's, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't uh, like these exclusively mountaintop experiences, you know, that's, no, 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 that's, that's more the realm of delusion. You know what I mean? Like an actual spiritual life (laughs) <laughs> where it enters into the mystery, it, where it enters into mysticism is the spiritual life unfolds. It leads you to this unfolding of the presence of God. And you can't help but experience God as mystery, hence mystic, mystic because God's ways are above ours and outside of ours, but you still encounter them and the way you encounter them permeate, transcend, blend in with, I mean, it's just, it, 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 it it becomes your whole life experience becomes permeated with it. And this is, this is really fascinating to me because I think that there's people who, now I think I know there's people who will have um, their whole life in, in, you know, being Christians or being Orthodox and they, they, they still maybe kind of don't understand this portion. And it's because in some regards, um, there it's so commonplace to them. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? It's so it's so commonplace to them that um they're not even able to. They wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily recognize certain things as quote unquote mystical experience or you know the kind of mystical presence of God. Yes. But like sometimes it, this, this is. Do you follow what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is what it's like being around my wife, Father. That you mentioned my wife. Mm-hmm. That like. I'll react to stuff where I'll be like, are you, are you even seeing what I'm seeing yeah. right now? This is, yeah. she'll just be like, what do you mean? That's just, yeah. and I'm like, well, are, are you, are you crazy? Like, yeah, what are the yeah. chances of that? And she's like, that's just, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. like endless stories <laughs> yeah, yeah. of people freaking out around saints. Like God can do that. And saints are like, yeah. 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 I mean, it's funny. Cause you talk to people who've gone to the Holy mountain and then it's just kind of like, and Pete and like talking with the, <laughs> excuse me the monks there it's just kind of like well yeah i mean did you see that happen it's like yeah and you know it, it's just it's so it's so commonplace um but I, I think i think the thing is is that interestingly enough there's this thing that happens for people um a lot of people they find themselves in a real pre- precocious situation in regards of spirituality mysticism the occult because they're looking for a mystical experience, right? And this, I mean, we, we've talked at length about this in regards to dilution. It's so dangerous because those experiences, you know, like for, those experiences don't lead you into a knowledge of God. They don't lead you into a place of knowing yourself. They actually lead you outside yourself in the wrong ways, right? They lead you to this place where, you know, you begin to externalize everything 
And I think that's where, if this, if this can make sense, I think a lot of the hollowing out of people happens by trying to, by thinking that, you know, mysticism is something very um, conspicuous as opposed to inconspicuous. That mysticism is something um, very, you know, kind of like um, flashy uh, and at times formal versus something that is just um, subtle, the subtlety mm -hmm. of, 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 of mysticism and spiritual life. And so, you know, it, it really becomes um, a matter of what is your intention that, and that's, I think that's where you can see how the new age um, and new age, as we understand it now, right? Like, um, well, I don't know how people would understand it now. Cause like, it's like, yeah, we think about like yoga and, you know, whatever, Latte. crystals crystals kabbalah pumpkins, astrology yeah, yeah kabbalah astrology you know instagram tarot um, yeah yeah you know pump, pumpkin spice kali you know <laughs> like that's that's how that's how yeah you know, that's how that's how a lot of people people understand it you know but that that's actually like the complete opposite of of what it, of what it really is you know so yeah. I mean this this thing that oh am I glitching for you guys? No, you're I'm good. like glitching. Okay, just a little bit. This, you're good. This this just aspect, Father, that you said about the the pursuit of the the flashy mystical and the ignoring of the real mystical, which is very, as you say, it's very it's very subtle, but it's it's there if you know what you're looking for. If I really interrupt you. Forgive me. I just don't want to lose yeah. it. I Go love, ahead. I love you. Forgive me. I just, want, I just want to throw this out for someone. You know, just understand one of the distinctions like this. It's the difference between, you know, um, we everyone's seen maybe some of those like shorts about the lady who looks like, you know, um, the witch who ate Hansel and Gretel. And then she puts some makeup on and she's like, whoa, right? Versus... <laughs> you know, versus um, the the love that happens when it's like, I love you know, just plain. I love you who you are. There's no need to you know dress it up. Does does that make sense? It's that's I'm I'm lost. What are you talking? Like about? one is one is seductive. One is yes. nurturing. You know, yes. one is seductive to in the intent of consuming, right? Black widow status, right? Mm -hmm. And one is natural and, and nurturing and selfless and brings you into a place of, of communion. You know, that's, that's, that's the difference, right? Well, one and, is, one is glamor, right? That in the glamor in like the mystical spell yeah, sense yeah. of like the covering over and the yeah. fooling. And the yeah. other one is an openness and exposure of yeah. it's, it's, but, one is well, covering one is, up what's there, and the other one, so, what's truly there, is coming through. On one the other is side. one is seductive. One is in in is I don't know if inviting is the right word. It's like mm -hmm. it's the, I it's, see what you're saying. Tantalizing. Huh? No, no, no. I mean, tantalizing. No, no, no. That's no. The other one. Like one is seductive and tantalizing, and the other one is you know modest and mm -hmm. and and inviting. It's like. One is unassuming. The other unassuming. one's like unassuming. One yeah. Is, yeah, one is unassuming. It's like, you know, the the bride being veiled, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. veil is there to invite you in and to present. Right? It, it's it, it represents an um a, a, an an invitation. It represents an unfolding. It represents an encounter. It represents you know all those things. It's the type of mystery there to to draw in. For the sake of 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 union, you know, being together, the other one is is objectified and and utilitarian and just kind of like, hey, you know, like, right, the seduction that it's the stripper versus the bride, you know, it's like that's that's the distinction. I think. And forgive me, I just wanted to throw that in there to give like. My no, it's 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 apt, and I think it goes to 
my ex my experience definitely with the occult when I was sort of like at the height of the my of it being toxic to me was the one thing that I can define from that time is, you know, I was in pursuit of the of that flashy glamour mm -hmm. of the mystical and I was being actually given it a lot. So it was like I, I was being given it on regular intervals, but it was that pursuit and the orientation looking there to where really the damage, the demonic damage being done on a day to day, minute by minute in the like mundane, subtle level, I was totally oblivious to. Mm -hmm. So it was it was almost like like, you, you know, like the little demons were eating little chunks out of me every day. But I was like, and I was ignoring that enamored by, oh, when's going to be my next fix of this big of the big glamour demon that's going to do this thing. And it was just like the foundation of me was being eaten out. And it's actually been the reverse since finding Christ that it's been like, uh, yes, there have been some of those big ones and they've been like, wow, but I haven't been in pursuit of them. And instead, because of a life of prayer, I, I, I've been more and more trying to pay attention to the subtle on the day to day That's... and be like, oh, this little thing. And, and it's really in seeing the accumulation of all of those where I'm like, wow, how blessed am I? This is incredible. Like what mercy, but it's, it's the, it's the small things, but yet I know I'm like, oh, that's God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's like, god that's part of my spiel with the some of the danger when i'm counseling people that's some of the danger that comes with drug addiction um is that the intensity and the largeness of an emotion is often um becomes synonymous with like the validity of the emotion so if oh wow good way good way of saying it so if somebody is very very angry and they feel it and it's white hot they are correct to feel that way because that emotion is so large well what what i would tell them is well you because you've been dancing around for sometimes decades years whatever with small g gods wow. you end up in this place of like you're used to those big large emotions and like and, and when people make mistakes it's oftentimes because they're following those emotions it's you know they are wrong and i'm sure we've all had that experience where um we've been you know like so sure that a person is screwing us over is doing something wrong and we're just so sure about it that the um we end up making a mistake based off of that. And so we, so we pursue this emotion because it's so large and so valid, quote unquote, we miss the subtlety. There's no room for nuance or anything like that. So, you know, like yeah. one of the things that I, for instance, mysticism, quote unquote, in this other sense, it's, well, what does it lead to? I don't know. It could lead to anything. It could lead to the grays. It could lead to Santeria. It could delete, I mean, it could lead to whatever, whatever, right? Um, versus like mysticism in the truest sense, right? Like it just leads to God and communion, right? And God, um, which we can get, I mean, I guess what we should talk about is just this, you know, the, 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 unknow the unknowable depths of God and being drawn into that through his energies and through the life of, the, you know, which is experienced in the life of the church. But I think one thing I want to say about the emotion things is that, We've talked a lot about it, but you know, I man, this is gonna emotions are one of the key ways that demons hook people. Yeah. And and it's one of the key ways that people find themselves really at odds with love. Right. And yeah. that's that's kind of like the weird paradox, right? Because people think love and emotions and emotionality, and even you know, there's whole generations now, especially of young women who their context for love is like drama. You know what I mean? They think that, yes. like, oh, that's how, that's how you know it's love because if there's mad drama and they like get addicted to creating drama and needing drama. Mm -hmm. And if there isn't drama, then there isn't love, you know? And like, oh, mm -hmm. and all of that is madness. 
it's madness and it's the it's the opposite of love and you know i i just i just find that there's so much um there's so much at play in regards of the manipulation of people's intentions and their desires through emotion by the demonic um and i'm not trying to force the thing in here i'm just telling you like it's really obvious in the sense of you know there's just certain things that are um so normative now that if if you have clarity and this is what orthodoxy does as opposed to all other quote unquote christian traditions is that it it really brings into focus the need of sobriety right and that and that sobriety um just on an emotional level is the only way to really enter into communion with god or with others for us in this time right because in this time there's such a strong delusion and intoxication through um you know this kind of if, if you if you understand how everything's over the top now in regards to visuals right oversaturated colors oversaturated you know everything is loud bang the sound movies right shorts all the stuff and tastes I, and taste. and sensation right. skin everything. sensations everything everything, yeah. everything, everything is over the top right well, you don't think that there's an, you don't think that, what, what do you think happened? What came first? Well, we can debate that, but I, I, the one thing I can tell you is that it has had an impact and the correlation between that and how people experience reality, including primarily love and relationships is absolutely conditioned by that. And so people only understand relationships and love, including with God and these sweeping, huge you know, movements and you're right. Like the way Andrew said it is perfect. It's like people conflate the bigness of an emotion with its validity and it's, it couldn't be further from the truth actually. Well, th this is the society of the spectacle, right? And it's yes. like the, the, the blockbuster, the, you know, people want to talk about the, the validity of a movie based on its budget, you know? Oh, this was a, yeah. billion dollar series yeah. to make this was a you know where it's like yeah 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 that's okay and i mean look taylor swift let's go back to taylor swift yeah. right they want to talk about the validity of her stardom because there's so many people that it makes an earthquake in every town that she goes to when they start dancing up and down and it's like what well, and and for us who have been exposed to actual music and who have a who have actually like played and performed it's like nah actually you know the greatest moments that i have had related to music have been in small intimate venues mm -hmm. and where it wasn't just me having that experience right because everybody around me afterwards was like what was that right what well, what that was the greatest that was the greatest night of my life like what was that i've never had an experience like that with music it was catered it was um orchestrated the the taylor swift concert is highly orchestrated some of the strongest performances are completely organic like it's not planned so like all of the all of the finest performances would be organic i, I think that that would be a that would be a prerequisite for it to actually be a fine performance well i, would I don't know if I don't know if I could say that, but I would say is, is that there are special moments like I've been jamming with someone or whatever. And suddenly like this thing happens and we didn't set out to do it. Nobody set out to like do anything and it just happened. And um, at a certain point, like it was like, what was that? You know, like, what was that? We didn't mean for that. Like, and it's like the same with like anything. It's like, if I approach Pasca if I approach the liturgy, if I approach even like the Christmas season, which is something I'm very bad about doing, I try to force these feelings of like, no, I'm going to feel these. It's like, it doesn't happen. And like, you can be in totally um, like enamored with uh, what's um, the glitziness and the, like the over top. There's a certain word. I'm not going to sit here and make you guys listen to me, find it, but the shock and the awe of something you can get so totally wrapped up in that, that like you think you've experienced something quote unquote real, but what you've really experienced is a carefully orchestrated set of things to manipulate you and bring you to a state of like, quote unquote wonder, but it's like small W wonder. It's like, no, 
you've seen Aquaman, the movie. You know, it's a great movie. I like it, but it, it's not like a work of art. You know, it's but not there's like- a lack of communion. That's what it is. Like with all of the spectacle and the orchestration, because the Taylor Swift concert is orchestrated, and that means that it has nothing to do with who's there in the audience. Oh, but yeah. the but from the standpoint of a piece of art, from the standpoint of a great musical performance, and and we as musicians and performers know this, who's in the audience matters. Yeah. Like you're there's a there is a back and forth that is occurring that is taking place and that you are both agreeing to be in communion. And I mean, this is I mean, this that's liturgy right there. Right. Is that it's like that no there's no one who's not playing a role. Mm-hmm. There's no one who's not involved, like, I guess, by default, because there actually is the Eucharist. And there actually, it's like like it's actually like at a technical level, I guess that's true. Yeah. But I think that's one of the things about where we see um, a real difficulty in trying to reach people in some sense. Um, And I don't mean reach people necessarily like in like getting numbers, but reach people in the sense of, you know, I'm um, trying to get them to understand and experience a problem. Right. It's like, because this idea of like, yeah, that's liturgy. It's like, yeah, like that is liturgy. And it, it kind of proves the point. Um, we've talked about this before, like people's experience, this happens to so many people, like they have a, a more profound experience um, at a chief's game than they do liturgy. People have a more profound experience at a concert, even in, like a good concert, than the liturgy. And like, why is that, you know? And I think this gets us back to what is what is the spiritual life? What is what is mystical life like? How in regards of how should you un- actually understand and experience mystical life? Because the the reality of being drawn into the spectacle it doesn't even have to be obviously like nefarious or nefarious at all in, in its intention, but there's a um. There's a sense of communion, or there's a sense of communing that actually isn't communing. That's that's I think a key thing that's prevalent in, in like what we're talking about. Because this is why so many of us, I mean, I think this is another way to explain all the conversations we had around subculture. Because what are we looking for? We're looking for communion. We're looking for community. We're looking for an experience of something transcendent, right? When we want to experience it with others, right? So it's like, I want to experience this higher thing, this meta thing, like the meta is the culture of being, you know, in, you know, being Gothic or being, you know, into black metal, whatever it is, right? And so we gather together with others, supposedly of like mind, and we enter into the work of being together, Um music is played there's lights given you know there's certain ritual around however you're going to dance you're going to how you're going to experience it and all those things bring people into a sense of like yeah you know like like that's why that those expressions like see this is church right the problem is right the problem is is that it's still autonomous in the sense that and this is where i think the conversation takes a turn for some people and they go like, man, you had me until right there. It's like, cause now this becomes fun, like sounding like a fundy for people, but it's, it's still autonomous. It's still tower of Babel. It's still, God's not involved. And I think this is, this is one of the things that like we have, we as Orthodox have to say to the world is that God exists. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like God exists. And, don't mistake God not wanting to kind of push in on you and do a whole Sodom and Gomorrah on you for God not existing. Don't mistake God, you know, being who God is, who is radically humble, radically loving, radically merciful for God not existing and being indifferent because people want that over the top experience that comes from all these other things that are a shadow or a mimicking of actual liturgy. And it's 
it's a difficult thing because like for me, the crest of that wave brought me to a place of being like, I know like this is all great. I've been through so many subcultures, so many scenes, so many experiences, you know, but there's still something that's not hitting. And, and then for me, the big breakthrough was like, Oh, it's someone mm. it's not, it's not something it's someone. And this, I, for me, I'm just trying to bring it back around to like the mystical life isn't about experiencing spirituality autonomously from God, which is that's what everything else is trying to do. Experience the spiritual life apart from God. And ultimately the left hand pass, left hand pass. It's the left all left hand path. It's all left hand path. path. It's all left hand path. And I, I know it's tough because underneath it, there's this portion which is kind of like we want to preserve something. You know what I mean? We want to be like Saul and want to be like, look, okay, cool. I'll go off fight the Amicalites. I'll do this and that. And I'll kill most of the cattle. I'll kill most of the people. But let me at least say, save this little bit. You know, I mean, some pretty good cattle, God. Let me, let me save these cattle here. And I'll give them to you, Lord, for offering. It's like, no, man. Everything's got to go. Everything's got to go. Because, first of all, if you want your life, you got to lose it, right? So it's like... You know, someone can go, I'll just pull it apart. Someone can be like, okay, Father, I think I understand what you're saying. But, like, if I'm understanding you correctly, how's this work out? Because you're kind of contradicting your whole, like, self, aren't you? Because you sure do talk a lot about music and some culture, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, let me tell you the secret, man. This is this is the deal, Joni. I can talk about all that because I've let it go. See, that's that's the big difference that I think people – need to kind of really come to an understanding about these things because it's only until you see them for what they are that you can, I guess, kind of like enter into it safely. Right. Because it doesn't, it doesn't affect you anymore. It's, it's, it's like this, it's like asceticism. Ascetics don't hate the body. They don't hate food. They don't hate sex. Right. It's actually quite the opposite. It's like, because those things are, are intended to be good, but we, but they know that, because of the fall and because of our passions that we tend to make idols of them for the sake of, of the body, which is good. You learn to lo- you learn to lose those things, right? It's the cross on a different level of experience. And so I think that's why, you know, if you want to enter into mysticism, you're an Orthodox Christian. It's like, okay, first thing you got to learn, you got to learn to actually take the fast seriously, because when you learn to take the fast seriously, you learn to say like, okay, like, you know, I'm going to say no to myself. Then what happens is your faculties become honed and and the subtleties of God that we were talking about earlier in the conversation, right? You get to catch those things. Whereas when you come in and you're just like, okay, cool, I'm going to pray. Okay, cool, icons and like all this stuff. It's like you're wanting God to hit you over the head with the experience stick, which is cool. That's fine. But there comes a point where... If you want to get into the deeper things, it's it it's not getting hit over the head. And I think that's why for a lot of us, we can enjoy music and it's like, I don't I don't have a problem with it. But you know what? I really don't listen to that much music like I used to. And it and it isn't like, oh, I'm spiritual. It's just like it's it's really tough to to have your faculties you know, tuned in in such a way. It's like, you know, I mean, I, I, I could, I could spend all night talking about bad analogies, talking about like, you know, the certain types of headphones and stuff like that. But I think everyone understands. It's kind you know, of it's like, for me, that? it kind of became about like self-preservation. It's like, yeah. no, there's no way I can be a good Christian. I can't go home and be a good dad. If I just blast my sugar on the way home from work it's too angry it's and they're not even like an angry band but it's too loud i mean it's pretty angry but i mean well and i mean i i don't even think it has to do with like well i I guess but i guess if anger is your passion right right because like the the music that i had to get myself away from is not angry music at all but it was it's like seductive music that was like the background of my the, it was literally the soundtrack of my former life. Like it was playing in the background of my life constantly. And I was cultivating that. 
I mean, and it's this... just like I can't I, if I do because I immediately feel it like if I if if that's around, I'm immediately back there and I'm like, what? What is this? Yeah. I mean, it's like Father Sarah from Rose. He's like, I'm just not I just can't listen to, to classical music anymore. Cla- and that's and like, classical. And that's music. classical. That's that's the point. That's why when people go like, <laughs> it's just, it just it just I don't know. One of the things that makes me pull out, you know, what a little bit of hair I have left makes me want to be just like, man, when people are like, oh, well, with the Orthodox think about X, Y, and Z. I'm like, man, right. if, you, if you, you know, just a warning out there, don't don't come to me if it's you don't know question. me. If you it's see me question. somewhere, don't I don't want to have a conversation with someone like this. Man, Father Turbo, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, John. Hey, you know, the Orthodox position on blah, 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 don't do that to me. I, because there is no Orthodox position except, right. you know, like, we call that dogma, right? Mm-hmm. We call it dogma and past, past dogma, right? We don't really get into it. We're like, yes, and. Right, like the orthodox, orthodox position on Taylor Swift. Yeah, you're not going to be an orthodox position. You're not going to be Swift. an orthodox position. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> I'm just saying this because, like that thing, it's like Flowers of Evermore, right? Classical music, like that's the thing that people. This is this is that actually really gets me to my point is that I don't and it's it's both and right. It's complementary. What Andrew's saying is complementary of what I'm saying in the sense of mm-hmm. there's been times in my life from like yeah. I need to let this go to be a better Christian, but then like I'm not I'm not at that place really. I'm right. I'm like, yeah, I can I can listen to you know, I can listen to Black Sabbath all day if I want to, but you know I don't really want to because mm-hmm. because it's not that Black Sabbath is is bad. I know people are losing their minds right now, but I'll debate you on that too, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's because there's something so much better. Right? right, like, right. like, I I haven't rejected. That's what, that's what I was trying to say about asceticism. It's, mm. it's, it's. I'm not fasting from meat and cheese because meat and cheese is evil, mm. right? That's that's not the point. It's actually because it's good, right? Meat and cheese mm-hmm. is awesome, right? I love meat and cheese, right? Um, and because I love meat and cheese, when I fast, it's so much more effective, right? Because I'm turning. My, I'm turning my being, my appetites, my desires to to the good, to something higher, right? And that's that's a hard thing for us because we're, look, we're so utilitarian. We're just like, okay, give me the script, right? Tell me mm. what I can and cannot do, and I'm I'm good, right? Yeah. It's like I can do that for you, Jimmy, but that's not love, right? Love isn't like, hey, you know, here here's. Here's the defining line and this and that. That's like, that's, 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 that's not it. Right. So asceticism, you can't really get into it until you understand freedom and love. And you can't really get into mystical life until you understand freedom and love, because it's one thing for me to have vigil and stay up all night praying because even though, like, I don't, I'm not going to tell anybody secretly, I really want to climb the ladder and become like holy. Right. Well, guess what? That's dangerous. That's not love. Like, that's you'll get, not, you'll fall into delusion doing that. You fall into delusion. That's not love. Yeah. yeah. Like, like that's not love. And and repentance is is also not some weird inverted, you know, kind of egocentrism where it's just like you're still focused on yourself. So, like. All I can think about is how terrible I am. That's not repentance either. There's an right. aspect to that, but that's not repentance. Repentance repentance comes and is birthed and is most powerful when it's experienced in the light of love. The pain of repentance is the pain of disappointing love. That's what yeah. the that's what the pain of repentance is. It isn't like I'm a piece of of doo-doo and like I can't stand it's like this is this is one of the reasons why it's really tough. I've seen this now, you know, where people, um, you know, they like, for instance, I, I, maybe you shouldn't read Sophroni, you know, because you don't understand what he's saying. Like, they read these words and they go like, oh, yeah, just, you know, the agony. It's like, yeah, but it's not this, it's not this pathological, like, neurotic, you know, self-hatred. That's not what. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what the ascetic, noetic tradition is talking about. When and it's not what the hymnography of the church is talking about. I've seen this over the years where people just kind of like, 
I can't pray the prayers of the church because it just makes me feel bad. It's like, yeah, because when you're reading about I'm the worst of sinners and this and that, like you're struggling with your own like egoism and your own, you know, kind of like neurotic pathological problems. You're, you're projecting that onto the hymnography of the church. Right. And so that's okay. And let's work on healing that, but that's not what it's talking about. And so it's, Mm -hmm. you can only, uh, you can only really understand this in the context of love. And I think, Right. You know, this is another moment where you can just kind of scrap everything we've talked about and just say, look, it's about love. I know how I know that's too simple for people. That may sound too reductionist. That sounds too Pollyannish for people. But I'm telling you, it's like ultimately everything's about the love of God. And so, you know, the ascetic does what they if an ascetic is truly an ascetic, they do it for the love of God. If someone is, you know, hardcore or whatever, they do it for the love of God. Anything else is vanity. Right. Anything else be- is, is about really like your identity and how you want others to perceive you. You know what I mean? But true love isn't really concerned about that. You know, like true love isn't really concerned about that. And I think on top of all that is, you know, this is one of the problems with the beauty of the church is that um, we are so um, our generation, the time that we're living in now is so sick. We're so sick. It's so hard for us to approach beauty and not project our own superficiality, our own kind of utilitarianism, our own kind of like prostitutive, if I could use that word, like like uh, tendencies towards things. Like we always think it has to be like we're super, like quid pro quo. Like okay, this is this. So this equals this. It's cons- a consumer relationship. It's, it's a consumer relationship. And that's, yeah. that's really problematic mm-hmm. because the beauty of the church is first and foremost a reflection of God and it's an offering to God, right? Mm-hmm. Like the beauty of the church is all about God and like people go like, no, it's not, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, okay. Like the person who doesn't think it is, that's the person who's going to fall into these temptations. But like the beauty of the church, the asceticism of the church, all of these things right? Come down to only being able to be understood in the, in the context of the love of God. And I don't mm. mean just the love of God, meaning our love for God. I mean, God's love for us. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's that beckoning, you know, the, the ability to encounter and participate in beauty without uh, an orientation or a desire towards acquiring or controlling that which you are experiencing. And I think that that's really hard for modern people raised in a consumerist environment because it's like we're trained from such a young age that it's like, oh, that thing is good. Therefore, I must have one that yeah. belongs to me that I put in my <laughs> cabinet over here and that i control it and that you may not have and look at how cool i am because i have it it's there's the 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 idea of pure and this is even down to like the natural environment i feel like even people who are like oh yeah i'm an environmentalist climate blah 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 they still want to block dc no 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 my my environment you can't even put carbon dioxide into no 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 put a block we own we own it we must keep it pristine rather than being like i appreciate the beauty i am participating in the beauty i want others to participate in the beauty i'm not seeking to control it i'm not seeking to own it you know i'm seeking i'm seeking to delve deeper into the beauty and in that way of course i want to to it, it, but it, it it is, you know, this is another thing that I've noticed, Father, and you commented on this. Um, yes, Andrew's Andrew had to step away because his daughter is is really not doing well, and so he's taking care of her. Um, oh. I have noticed, like, and and is this a thing? Maybe we've maybe I've asked you about this before, but I feel like there is a a correlation between well i mean it's definitely grace but i feel like when when i'm in that and when i'm in the groove like Mm. with my prayer life i feel like my my and maybe i don't know maybe i'm imagining this i feel like my children have fewer of these little freak like 
oh, sick for an evening, this sort of thing. And when I really feel myself falling off, like if that, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty fastidious about like my prayer rule and things like that. But, you know, when my intention isn't there and my attention isn't there, I feel like there's a lot more illness around me. Yeah, but you know what? It's like, is that, that old, a thing? It's like that old cone. First, okay. on, on a long journey, first there's trees, the no trees, mm. and there's trees. Mm. It's like, yeah, that's true, but like, you know, you're going to, if you keep going, you'll come out of that. I'll, uh, I'll give you a classic example today, mm-hmm. tonight, tonight, right? <clears throat> so, um, you know, just you know, this is the perfect example. So when I was in Serbia, um, it was like, you know, every day was incredible. It was just like, mm-hmm. it just every day went, was over the top, right? But on one day in particular, it was like, man, you know, we were, we were in the hotel, we were talking, just reflecting on the day, and it's like, I get this text from Papadi, it's like, oh, boom, due to my, my uh, second oldest, it's like, boom, um, he's in a car accident. Boom, oh, his my goodness. Totaled. His car's totaled, and I'm like, ah, she's like, he's okay, but like, boom, 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 you know? And like, that whole thing came in line with like I lost my luggage, like all the all these temptations happened. Oh. All these temptations, right? Okay, whatever. Boom. So like you know, I mean, right there, it's like how? What am I gonna do? You know? And so you know, uh, you know, you, you praise God, you know, and you just keep moving forward. Now here's the thing, right? Great, great timing. So I come back to the States, you know, and I still don't have my car. Right. So, so he didn't have a car and he just started his new job. So I gave him my car. And so I had to use this old, you know, Jetta that was given to us and blah, blah, blah. It's this rat, this is rat mobile. Great. No problem. But I've been rolling around in this rat mobile for the last few weeks. Right. And you know, it's like, it's like McGilla gorilla in a getting in like one of those, like, <laughs> that's like the clown car. I'm like, right. even today, someone made a comment. It's like, man, it's a small car. You're a big dude. I'm just like, yeah, you know, I'm just like, okay, whatever. I'm driving around this, this tiny rat mobile. And then, um, so today, like we bought his car. Don't worry, this is going somewhere. So we get his car today, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then like, you know, um, we're waiting on everything, and I get a text, and it's with Potty, and she's just like, hey, he's trying to get over here to give you your car, but, like, it won't start, and there's, like, this whole thing. And it's just this kind of last minute, like, yeah, 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 yeah. poke in the eye. And so I was like, hey, no worries. So, like, I just text him. I go, boom, 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 like, hey, man, it's the devil. He's like, yeah, yeah whatever, but <laughs> wow, right? And I told him, I said, hey, and it's tough because, like, shout out, you know, because he's going to listen to this. But I was like, hey check it out and we don't need to get into the whole thing but i just i think this is a really relevant you know mm. it's like you know i'm i'm knee deep right. in a manual on demonic possession mm-hmm. you know what i mean I, like i'm knee mm-hmm. deep in it right when this text comes right and so what i find is that oftentimes you know the low hanging fruit is my loved ones now mm. because you know when you get to this place where it's just like okay you know it's just like you're in it like what do you i'm i'm you know um you don't find yourself getting phased as much but you know what can hurt you is your loved ones right mm-hmm. and so when you take another step forward in things that's what i have found is that the people closest to you become easy targets um, and that's why it's it's tough because, you know, you got to learn to invest time in fortifying your loved ones when you begin to step out for the sake of Christ. Because if you don't, they're not going to know, number one, how to preserve themselves and be steadfast in prayer. And number two, they can become tools of the enemy against you. It says in the scripture that a, a man's enemies will be of his own household. Mm-hmm. Right? It says in the scripture, and it's like when you're dealing in the spiritual realm with these things and you're taking, let's say, a more offense, offensive stance, mm-hmm. not offensive, but offensive stance, mm-hmm. that low-hanging fruit comes to the family. And so, like, part of – we're just talking, whatever, but mm-hmm. I think part of the thing is, like, you know, your, your girls are young. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your girls are young, but it, it becomes a different comes a different game. Right. Um, when you start dealing with, you know, young adults and adults and and you know what I'm saying? Um mm-hmm. and I think I think this is another aspect of like the mystical life, you know, is that again, there's principles. Um, and there's certain kind of, yeah, there's principles and there's certain certain laws that you begin to navigate. You mm-hmm. know, you get to see how like the certain laws apply. Like like just to give an example, um, one of the quickest laws to learn is the law of uh judgment. Mm-hmm. Like when you begin to practice the spiritual life, the mystical life, it's like boom, that's one of the quickest ones you learn, which is you know, measure what you judge, you shall be judged. Mm-hmm. And it's like it's a foolproof one, right? Um, and so it's not even about just wanting to be moral, but you're just like, hey, almost out of self-preservation, you realize, man, I'm going to watch my judging because, yeah, it's like, yeah, I don't want to be a bad guy. I don't want to judge people. But also, too, just on a low level, I, I hate the repercussions of it, mm-hmm. right? So so I just I really watch my judging. You know what I mean? And, Father, I have Both. to tell you, it's, uh, it, it's, <coughs> it's crazy. that That's not crazy. It's providential that you bring that up because it, it, there's actually – a situation that happened within yesterday, within 24 hours of right now, where it occurred to me, and it's something I had been thinking about, of a friend of mine who's here. We had had a conversation, you know, about some other friends, and he, you know, it's whatever. They're they're a little they're a little odd. They're a little strange in some of the things that that, that it appears that they're into, you know. And he he had had a real like he kind of made a joke of it, and it was it was whatever. It was an evening whatever, and then it kind of. He kind of he sent me some meme or something that was clearly directed at the conversation that we had had before. And I like explicitly had to say to him, like, dude, I'm not judging. I'm withholding judgment mm-hmm. like on this. I'm sorry. I can't I like I'm not even going to like, OK, it's funny, but I'm just telling you right now, like based on the things that I've done in my life and what I've seen, I cannot. I'm no one to judge. I cannot judge. And it just occurred to me like. Mm. Yeah, that particular judgment, especially for this particular person, I was like, ooh, dude, you probably, you of all people probably don't want to be starting down that road. And I just had a, and I wanted to express it to him because I was like, ooh, this is the exact person who's going to be stung by, by this. Mm-hmm. If he, br- if he starts to bring attention to this, right? Yeah, I, is, I just I, I had to mention that because it was within 24 hours of now, and I really recognize it's a big deal. Yeah, 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 I mean, I mean, listen, it's one of those things where, like, I think that's another aspect of quote unquote mystical life is like, it really ceases to become some abstract thing, mm-hmm. and you begin to. It's just like anything else. It's like it, it's paradoxical in the sense that it becomes concrete. It becomes more concrete than everything else. Like. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It becomes it becomes more real than than anything else, and you begin to just live by it. It begins to inform your very being, and that's that's one of the, another misnomer is that, um, you know, there's that there's that movie, you know, the movie Stalker. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, cool right? it's like it's like that is a great movie in regards of. Um, if you understand, if you if you can decipher certain moments in it, you know it's like where um, the stalker, you know, when he's you know throwing the handkerchief, right? It's like you got to do exactly as I say. It's like, yeah, there's there's no there's no um, like linear to it, mm. but. But it's it that doesn't make it any less concrete. You know, the fact that it's not linear doesn't mean it isn't at, that that doesn't make it abstract in that sense. You know what I mean? Because it becomes more and more, um, it becomes more and more circumscribed. You can you can see more and more of like what the spiritual life is, what the mystical life is. The more and more you enter into communion, the more and more you see. It's like okay, like this is pretty wild. You know, like this whole because these laws aren't arbitrary. No, they're not clearly just a, not. They're, they're, you know, they all reflect relation to God and to and to other, right? And that mm-hmm. that's that's I think one of the big things about what's hidden behind quote unquote religious life that people 
um, you know, the paradox is that if you enter into religious life, you have to enter into a life of morality, but morality and moralism aren't the same thing. Right. And so mm. that moralism leads you to a place where that it's linear, it's system, it's systematic and all those things which are contrary to dynamic, you know, um, deep love. And right? this is, and, and this is the orientation towards the, towards the person and towards love, because if you are oriented there, like you will become, you will, the actions that you take because of the laws being what they are, the, the, you will be described as moral. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need to pursue morality if you're pursuing Christ, because if you're genuinely pursuing Christ and behaving as his servant, you will be moral. Like it, you don't it, even it, need to think about morality. You don't even need to think about it. Yeah. You don't even need to think about it. Like, and that's where the Yudodipi, like the holy fools, they really become yes. powerful here because yes. the holy fools, it's like they turn, they turn, they reveal the issues of moralism. Like that's mm -hmm. one of their main functions is that they turn that on its head. And it's like, who's going to accuse really holy fools of being immoral? They're not immoral, mm -hmm. right? But they, but they are in contra to the morality or, or not the run, but the moralism mm -hmm. that quote unquote religious people wield. Right. And that's, that's like the perfect example. You know, it's like, um, we just had uh, a couple of days ago as our Slava on Friday, uh, St. Uh, Theophil, the fool mm -hmm. that caves. He's our, mm -hmm. he's my family's patron. And it's like, he shows father wait he's your family's patron yeah really yeah yeah let oh, so here we go full circle to i just got goosebumps because yeah. uh because you know he's the he's uh the patron of uh of edgar yeah. and he didn't and he said he didn't even know why he picked him yeah yeah so he well, was chosen well, he too him. Wow, yeah, he was chosen. Alpha picked him. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, well, yeah. So for people who don't know Edgar Cards, who's the who's the uh, person who did our our intro and who does our the artwork for our merch. So for people who did yeah. not know, it's Yeah, check out his channel, Holy Fools. By the it's way, incredible. incredible. Fools Incredible for Christ. Stuff. Fools for Christ. Excuse me. Yeah, fools spe for Christ. Speaking that... of Holy Fools, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean. The life of Saint Life of Saint Theophilus is just it's wild. You know what I mean? But that but that turning the religious moralism on its on its head, it's like who's gonna accuse, you know, Saint Theophilus not he wasn't immoral, right? Mm -hmm. Quite the opposite, right? But it's it's in that inversion of the moralism that we that we see something, you know. And I I, I find it to be um one of the more you know, kind of, um, inv if I use this word, invigorating aspects of the spiritual life of the mystical life too, is that my spiritual father, one of the things I've always loved about him is that, you know, he's, gosh, he's, you know, gosh, I don't even know how old he is now. He's like going into his eighties, if not 80 already. And he's, as long as I've known him, he's, he's always been a disciple. Like there's never, he's never ceased to be a disciple. He's never ceased to be like, okay, I got this. You know what I mean? There's always this, he, he's just always hungering and thirsting and, and just going deeper and chasing after Christ still. It's like, that is a great example of what we see in regards of when someone's given a vocation, when someone's entering into the mystical life, whatever the thing is, it's like, it never becomes this, um, Oh, I, I own this. I'm wielding this. It's love. It's that. It's that. It's that dynamic we're talking about of communion. It's everything becomes communion, you know. And that I think that really, you know, I don't know how to make it more concrete because I, I think it might feel abstract for people still. But it's like everything becomes about communion. Like everything, you know. There isn't anything that doesn't that 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 becomes out of that and. Here's the thing. If something isn't in that circle of communion, you pretty much end up letting it go. Like, yes. not because, like, getting back yes. to that music portion, right? Yes. Not because it's bad, but because it's like, man, it's like, this is so much. You know, I don't, it's almost like I don't got time for that. You know, I want to be pursuing love. You know what yes. I mean? That's, that's, that's the thing. That's There's the thing. a, it's, it's, oh, man. 
this is this is kicking off to me so much about you know how how it really exposes the the emptiness of this the pursuit that is like the re- red pilly manosphere type of I, I'm thinking there was a a, a clip <coughs> showed up in my uh, YouTube feed of uh, David Goggins, who I've always thought is one of the like people put him on a pedestal as though he's like some great. I've always seen him as a, a really uh, sort of a pitiable person, like someone who I, you know, where he's like, yeah, I did the Iron Man on two broken legs. And you're just like, yeah, man, I don't really like. I don't I, I feel kind of bad. Like, I feel bad for you. I feel like I, I want to like you're 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 sick. You have an illness. But there's it, it's just recently. And it's like it's him. He's like he's on an empty street. He goes, it's, I'm, I'm out here. It's three in the morning. Now, three in the morning. It's just like it's crazy. I'm out here. It's three in the morning because I often get up at four thirty or five to go yeah. and pray or work out or something. Yeah. And I'm like, why three? That's too early. But he's like, it's three o'clock in the morning. Look over that way. Pay, can, it's pans. He's like, nobody there. Look over that way. Nobody there. He's like, you know, I'm out here. You know, what's motivating me. It's motivating me that there's nobody else out here. And I'm the one out here. And I'm just like, man, this is, that is the saddest. Cause it is just like, no. Uh, and he's doing it completely unironically to where it's like, wow, yeah. you have there's on every single level. The fact that it's just like your own. Oh, so it's just you. Nobody, except it's not just you, because you brought a camera out here to show how it's just you. I mean, that's the thing, right? Like one of the one of the hallmarks, as we all know, another hallmark of the spiritual life. Um, and so, if people haven't been tracking, using spiritual life and mystical life is interchangeable, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Because well, I don't I like mystical mysticism. This gets us into some of the Goggins realm yes, by using that okay. term, I think, is that, you know, it's like you don't want your left hand knowing what your right hand does. You know what I mean? And and you go into secret, you know, in the closet in secret. And I think that's one of that. Look, that's like one of the number one things you got to learn to do. And mm-hmm. like someone could say, well, isn't that what he's trying to do is to like really kind of push that motivation. I'm like, well. I don't know, but taking it from how you're saying it and taking my little bit of like what I've seen of him, I'm like, I don't think so. You know, it's like, um, he's, I don't know him. Right. But just in this context that we're talking about, that context is what I would put in the category of a mercenary. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, like that, that cat's not a son. You know what I mean? It's a, and it's, it's the thing of like the hero, who is a hero in, in, in um, I don't know what the word would be, but it's not the sense of when I think of hero, a true hero can't be like, you can't think of a hero apart from his people or apart yes. from, you know what I mean? Because, because why even it, exist? Why even exist? Like, like what's that guy who's just like, well, I just did this to show people I could do it. Well, that's a devil. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's, that's, <laughs> You know what I mean? Oh well, I that's just, pride because that's pride, isn't pride. it? Pride. It's it's yeah. it's pride and it's vanity. You know what yeah. I mean? Because it's yeah. like okay, you know, and and like I'm sorry, but not, I think I think there's a there's just a reality to that. That's why, again, this this gets into a whole thing, right? Like, you know, you can't just say no to physical health. That's ridiculous, right? Right. 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 And I'm not saying that, but on the other end, it's like the father is running on two broken legs, healthy. Clearly, like, (laughs) like, look, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, right? You know, like, there's a whole side where it's like, okay, it's good to be healthy, it's good to have some guns, it's good to be able to do whatever. But like, anyone who's going to say to me there isn't, like, okay, you can't live the spiritual life and also not be aware of like how to temper that, right? I think that's, I feel comfortable saying that. I feel comfortable saying it's like, you know, and maybe the way through that is to being like, yeah, I know it's vain, but I'm still doing it. You know? Okay, cool. Cause at least you acknowledge, at least it. you acknowledge it. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That that's the thing is uh, as mm-hmm. long as you can acknowledge it, it's like, it's okay. And 
and this is this is why all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. And beginning to really understand, it's like, yeah, I can do whatever I want. You can do whatever you want, but at the end of the day, you know, what is what are you desiring, right? And that's where that's where passions really come into play in, in regards of living a mystical, quote unquote, or spiritual life. Is that, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, our motivations, right? The most dangerous thing for the mystical, quote unquote, life, the spiritual life, is the religious life. Because the person who becomes fixated on the externals becomes fixated on kind of goal oriented quote unquote, spirituality, right? Like you're, you're headed for some, from some real problems. And that's why, you know, Sophroni, St. Sophroni, the elder, he talks about this in regards of, you know, for instance, people being all about techniques of the prayer. It's like, yeah, you know, there's all these like breathing techniques and blah, blah, blah. But it's like the, the surest, quickest way is repentance. Because, mm. yeah, because look, you know, it's like, what's the purpose of the prayer? The purpose of the prayer is to be united to God. But there's a lot of people who they approach the prayers just like it's, you know. A spell. A spell, Christian yoga, Christian magic. Yeah. You know, it's like they want the power of the prayer. It's like, man, well, the power of the prayer is just being with Christ. Like that's, yes. that's, that's, that's the key thing, you know. And so I think it's the same thing in regards of when people experience the regenerative power of like repentance, right? It's like. It's like repentance changes things like miraculously, right? But there comes this place where, you know, it's like Simon Magus. You know, mm -hmm. what is this power of the Holy Spirit that you have? You know, and if it's not tied to, you know, being like that, you know, like the like the gospel uh, a couple of days ago about the demon, the Gadarenes, you know, yes, yes, and he's like, hey, you know, he begged to be with the Lord, right? He was like, he the Lord clothed him in his right mind and he just begged to be the Lord because he was yeah. so grateful. But what the Lord say, Lord's like, nah, you go back to your people. Right. And it's like, at that point, it's interesting to me because I'm just throwing this out there. He, you know, he obeyed. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, he obeyed and like, that's love. He's like, man, I mean, you did this for me. So like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Even though I want to be with you, like the, like, the, the demoniac would have been like, man, I want to be with you. You liberated me. But he's like, but you know what? If uh, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So he's like, okay, obedience. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what he did. You know, it's, so. it's, it's ironic. This idea of wanting to wield the power of the prayer and the fact that the without it's only in repentance that the prayer has power because it's only in repentance that the prayer is genuine. Cause I mean, are you listening to the, are you even paying attention to what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, cause here's the other thing. It's like, well, what's repentance about? It's like, well, it's not about some sort of like impersonal mm -hmm. force. It's not about like, Oh, I need to make myself right with the universe. Like who, <laughs> like that's not, that's not a thing, man. You yeah. know what I mean? And how would you even do that? How would you even know would, what yeah. that even looks like? <laughs> like, look, you talk to me about the universe. It's like, what? Well, that can be whatever you want. Exactly. Like, that's why it's so convenient. Exactly. You know, that's why, like, you know, here's another thing. Don't ever talk to me about the universe because, like, yeah, you're going to force me to, like, really hold my eyeballs to keep them from rolling in the back of my head because I father, just... I used to say that. And now I hear people say it. And exactly that's I'm exactly like, oh. Yeah, it's so cringy. You know, it's like uh, the universe. Like, yeah, the universe. Okay, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's like, yeah. So, so I think, I think when we pull back on it, and it's like, okay, you know, um, that's where, like, for instance, how would you make all this concrete? Another way is the mm -hmm. it's the it's personal, quote unquote, you know, theological terms. You, we say hypostatic, but like obedience. You know what I mean, mm -hmm. it's like okay. This doesn't make any sense to me. Christ, I can't see him. And like, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, listen. Here's another rule. It's like, so number one, right? Like, you know, don't let your left hand know your right hand is doing. Learn to do things not secret and hidden for the sake of being secret and hidden. Like, because that's what a cult means. It's mm -hmm. not just for the sake of being hidden. But it's so that you could only be seen by God. Like, you want to inculcate that ethos. You only want to do things for the sake of being seen by God, right? And then if God calls you 
to take your bushel and put it on a lampstand, then may it be blessed, right? Because then I could see someone be like, okay, Father, well, why are you on YouTube? It's like, blah, blah, well, God told me to put my lamp on the, on, on the lampstand. So that's what I'm doing. So take a hike. But the other thing I would say is the, the second part of that is that it becomes tangible through keeping the commandments, you know, like keeping the commandments of Christ and obedience, that becomes the way in which we really begin to move out of the abstract realm. If that is a thing and really get into this concrete and like you begin to experience the person of Christ. It's like, I was thinking about this, how, um, you know, I'm in another, I'm in another phase of watching a lot of, um, uh, like NDEs and uh, for various reasons, you know, um, uh, near death experiences, right. Mm-hmm. And people's testimonies of what they saw, blah, 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 and, you know, um, all that, you know, to be announced later. But I've been looking at this a lot lately and kind of like studying a little bit. And it's, it's funny to me because like one of the things that you see is you see these, um, you see these these experiences where people um, are not having a um, impersonal encounter. So, in other words, it's like you know, it isn't just like the light or something a tunnel like of that. light, and I move toward it, and yeah, they're experiencing they're experiencing like you know God and Christ and like something and something mm-hmm. personal, right? And I think this is really important because you know these people who they can say this is this is why I'm bringing this up because this thought of like people people who are like I just I could never get behind it I could never um, I could never like live authentically religious life because I just don't believe and I want to uh, believe uh, right so this to this type of person right so I I would say you know I don't I don't know if it's possible to really practice obeying the commandments of Christ right? Um, practicing obedience to Christ as it's been revealed. Even if you don't feel it, I can't imagine someone actually being able to do that, you know, and like really giving it the good go- the good old college try and then not beginning to at least experience what we're talking about in regards of, you know, Christ, the person of oh, Christ, 100%, right? 100%. You, you know, not, not the Christ consciousness, not the kind of universe. No, a person, like, a person. A person. Yeah, a person. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, and it's yeah, tough because absolutely. this is this kind of loops us back to like why it's so tough because we're so cynical. Um, we're in all these situations that so it's like, well, why would I ever do that? Why would I ever try to do something that I don't believe in? It's like, well, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I get what you're saying, but on the other hand, it's like if it's true, if these pre- presuppositions that we have as as Christians is true. I mean, I don't really know what you would got to lo- what you have to lose by at least trying, because that's the weird thing and the hard thing, and maybe even the tragic thing is that you don't get understanding first, and then obedience. You have to obey mm-hmm. first, and then the understanding comes. You know, and there's mm-hmm. a reason for that, but it's in that it's in that obedience uh, to the commandments that you begin to enter into communion because here's the thing what I think people don't understand is that the, the sacrifice that Christ offers, which is himself is universal. So people have it twisted and they think that like they need God to do something special just for them. Well, he already did that. He already did something special just for you. That's your turn. It, it's your turn to now enter into what it means to be to be God, and so through the cross, through learning to what it means, learning to know what it means to love the other for the sake of the other, that's how you begin to enter into. That's how you begin to get dialed into where you could even hopefully experience who God is, right? But if that's why people who are fundamentally selfish, even though they may be religious, they really struggle because. You can't be you can't be selfish at your core and be in communion with God, right? You can be religious, you can have externals, but you can't be fundamentally at your core and not challenging that, right? Because we all deal with selfishness, but you know, there's a difference between someone who's like, I I know I'm selfish and I'm trying to work through it, versus the person who's like practicing it and it's like it's a virtue for them, right? You like those people are people who 
fundamentally will struggle seeing God because it's an impurity of heart, right? Blessed are pure in heart for they shall see God. Like that impurity of heart of like ego and like the love of self first and foremost, it's it's completely antithetical from experiencing God, you know? The one of the things that I think that defines for me when I know and I and the people who have said some version of this, it's going through my head and like it's a it's a really powerful realization but it seems to be you know when i encounter people and i'm like "Mm," like they're they're really on it in terms of the spiritual life uh and especially you know orthodox people interacting with let's say sort of like atheists or whatever i think that the thing that's missing from a lot of like the worldly view is the and and it goes to like a self-centeredness is the inability to acknowledge the unlikelihood of the fact that you're still alive right now. Like how much everything in the world is trying to kill you at all times. All times. And the fact that you're still alive. And it's like, look, <laughs> if we, this will, we wouldn't exist. Okay. Yeah. If there were without God, we, without God and God's mercy, we wouldn't exist because there's clearly a person who loves mankind, who is allowing us to, because we, like, I look around and I'm constantly the whole I, hostile. The whole, the whole world, world is so hostile. The whole fallen world is hostile because of the fall. Everything's hostile towards us. Like, and yet, and yet we thrive. How is this? Yeah. yeah. How yeah. is this? And I think that it's that in the light <laughs> to, to go, to go sort of back to what we were saying is that, you know, what moving towards Christ and being able to have my spiritual look, I I had I think I had mistakenly in the you know, when I was in the occult, I had mistakenly thought that it like the rules were a little bit different. That it was kind of like, oh no, we are naturally as human beings, we're we're such a great species Mm -hmm. that we're able, and this is the fallen narrative. We're such this special species that has evolved so perfectly. And, and then the demons can give us like a little boost. Like they can, if we'll bow down to them, they'll give us a little boop and pop us above everybody else. But it's like, no, 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 no. That's not it at all. Like the, 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 you're being attacked at all times. And it's only the fact that like on a day to day basis, there is this steady infusion of mercy that is, that is allowing for you to not be dead today. Yep. Yep. And I find it, you know, this is, I guess getting to like maybe a third principle is like gratefulness. Mm. And I think, and for me, this is where it becomes really hopeful because gratitude, interestingly enough, gratitude, speaks to the kind of human condition in regards of like being man being made in God's image because you know we don't have a we don't have the market cornered on gratitude in fact quite the opposite this is one thing where I find you know we oftentimes as Orthodox Christians um, you know maybe maybe there's some shame there you know because I don't think that a lot of people would characterize their awareness of orthodoxy as like, or orthodox people as gratitude. Mm -hmm. Like most people like, Oh, orthodoxy. It's like some sort of like, you know, kind of something going to be associated with like, obviously because of the term like right worship, but like, Mm -hmm. you know, Oh, like correct. Correct. Epistemology or correct history. Or like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Oh, orthodox people, they tend to be like, whatever. Right. No one thinks yeah, orthodoxy and orthodox people, thankful people, grateful people. And that to me is sad. That's an indictment. Like, we should be the most grateful people. Like, if anything, sh- people should know us by our courage and our, and our, and our, um, our gratefulness, right? Because that is one of the key things. Like, uh, someone who's living a spiritual life is someone who's able to enter into being grateful. You know, it's like, mm. I, I'm not one to I'm not one to quote Father Alexander Schmemann much, but you know he has a great quote about someone a soul that can be grateful or thankful is a soul that can be saved, and I, I think that's really powerful and it's hopeful because there's so many people who you know just 
I mean this in a charitable sense, so this is going to, you know, come off as distasteful for a lot of people. So my humble apologies, but um, so many people's spirituality is trash. You know, it's like, it's not based on anything, you know, in regards of like epistemology, metaphysics. It's not based on anything like moral or whatever. It's, it's very self-centered. It's very vain. But, but a lot of people who have a trashy, you know, kind of like system, the one thing they, they tend to have, which I think is the saving grace, is they'll be known like, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. And I'm like, that's beautiful. When I encounter anyone who's grateful, I'm like, I, I praise God because I go, there's hope for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. If someone can be grateful, there's hope for you. And that, I think, is the kind of scruff of the back of the neck that God can grab that puppy you know, the, that, that little soul and, and bring them someplace. If you can be grateful and as Orthodox Christians, we need to be more grateful because what does the Eucharist mean? It means Thanksgiving, right? And so being able to really live in a, gra- a state of gratitude and awareness of gratitude, that to me is one of the great hallmarks of, of living an authentic spiritual life, mystical life is, are you grateful? Because that's one of the key things about humility, you know, that's the on ramp to humility is being thankful. And maybe this is a, and maybe, you know, and, and maybe this is to not fully judge David Goggins because one of the things that he does have that I think is admirable. And as you talked about, you know, these little things in your life, it, I, I wanted to key in on it at the time, but I want to mention it so that I don't forget it is that, you know, these things happening in your life that are, that are, you know, what we would term as like setbacks or we might think as frustrating things or whatever. And you referred to them as temptations. And I was like, Ooh, most people don't. I was like, Oh no. Oh, that's what it is. Oh, that's the right way to look at it. Is it's like, Oh no, what's really happening here has nothing to do with the act with the, with the specifics of the thing. What's really happening here is it's a temptation to me to, anger to despair yeah your passion to, to it's it's a temptation it's it's all a test right it's a test to be like okay here you go the demons are like what oh we're gonna throw him into into his passions at this point and it's like to be grateful and this is david goggins right that it's like oh i'm thankful for the test yeah. i want the test give me the test right oh yeah. because it shows me that I'm not as strong as I thought I was. It shows me that I still have a lot more work to do. And it's like, oh yeah, to be convicted in that moment. So it's like this, this weird, but beautiful to where it's like, okay, this bad thing happens. Okay. I'm tempted into this, but because I'm living the spiritual life, I recognize it as a temptation instead of just falling into it. And now I'm grateful that, oh, thank you, Lord, for giving me the opportunity to draw closer to you and to find strength in you in this test. Yep. 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 Because the reality of being able to give thanks to God in any circumstance, Mm. that's, I think how we should be defined. You know what I mean? Like in a genuine way, because I think, I think people will say it, Oh, but they don't really. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Agreed. Because I would say it's one of the hallmarks, for me, you know, like I only say this because I'm a priest, so it's like it's part of my vocation. But is someone's making that transition into some degree of maturity in regards to orthodoxy? Okay, are they authentically able to do that more often than not? Right. That's that's a that's sign. A good heuristic, yeah. That that's you know what I mean. And so, I think when we begin to, you know, kind of um. I've been I've been talking about uh, how um, you know this. Um, there's a Saint Saint John uh, Cucazelli who, like, he's a chanter, writes hymnography and stuff like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he had a vision about monks of the Kleros, um, who those who were chanting with awareness of what they were saying and chanting received a gold coin, and then those who weren't kind of really as aware of what was being said, you know, they still received, you know, some, some sort of like coinage, but it wasn't gold coins. Um, I think about this a lot in regards of 
things like Eucharist. Mm. We all say it, we all kind of want to, but like who really knows what it means like Thanksgiving, mm. right? Who really kind of takes that in? And I think that, you know, you know, hopefully it's something that somebody, if they're, li- you know, who would listen to it, you know, listen to this episode would be like, wow, being grateful. Like, not just like, oh, for like um, all the good things, like on that kind of great weekend I have, but like, oh, this needs to be kind of an orientation of mine. This is kind of how how I should be living my life is in the state of gratefulness. And the Eucharist is about being thankful to God. To me, that's a life-changing, hopefully, for someone, hopefully, I'm, I'm, I'm praying that that's very, like, eye-opening because it's it makes all the difference in the world, you know? So. Oh. Or at two hours, I think that's the right place to end it. On the most Lord important, on the most important thing. <laughs> Lord to God, I'm going on my second week of tea and cough drops. So. <laughs> All right, so I can't end it as good as as Andrew, and I don't have a little outro, but we do have a merch store. It's at royalpath.store, uh, and contact at royalpath.network is how you can get in touch with all of us. And uh, yeah, playlist check everything's in the description everything's in the description whether you're on podcast or whether you're on uh you know what to do you know what to do you know what to do all right so we'll uh we'll see you next time thank you for having a good night bye-bye night